How do seismic hazards such as earthquakes affect our communities and our infrastructure? In this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, we'll be talking with Dr. Chikwebuka Nueke, who is an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Southern California. He'll be telling us more about seismic hazards and their impact that earthquakes have on our infrastructure. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I'm excited to be bringing you another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. Before we dive in, we'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Now let's dive into today's episode. Welcome to the show, Chukwe Buka. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Jerry. Uh, thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's It's been a while. It's been a while, but I'm glad we're able to reconnect. This is good. This is good. Definitely, definitely. So if you could tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and what is it that you do on a daily basis, let us know. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't want to be too cliche, uh, but, you know, I, I'm kind of like a lifelong learner. Uh, a man who, like most people in the world, has made a ton of mistakes. Um, uh, a person who understands that he doesn't know how much he doesn't know. So, like, I'm, you know, in general, I'm just a stubborn person. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I persevere. Uh, uh, my day to day typically falls along uh, the lines of being like, you know, I'm a young, I'm a young assistant professor, so I'm working towards changing the world for better, for the better, you know, through my research endeavors and improving resiliency and sustainability um, of infrastructure, um, through my teaching and mentoring of members of the local community global society, um, and through my service and outreach, uh, my hope is to inspire future engineers and scientists, especially young black boys and girls. Um, I know, <laughs> at the same time, I'm also working towards tenure. Uh, that's also important. Uh, so in essence, my day-to-day consists of a variety of things. You know, I, this includes teaching, reading, writing, meetings, discussions, mentoring, the usual administrative activities, email, paperwork, you know, stuff like that, uh, and conducting research analysis, uh, typically coding and model development, or I'm going in the field and I'm gathering data, or I'm doing lab tests. So that's typically what I do, kind of a snippet of who I am. Okay, sweet. So it sounds like you probably don't have two days that are exactly the same. <laughs> no, they actually, no, there's no day that's the same, actually. No day. It's a, every day is a surprise. Wow. Did you did you always think that you would be here? Or is, is this, uh, you know, as a professor, is this something that you always pictured as a young person? Or You, you know, that's a very, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I I don't think it, that that wasn't the case. You know, as a young child, you know, I grew up in Nigeria, so I spent about twelve years of my life in Nigeria. Um, and during that time, a lot of my focus was, you know, just enjoying life. You know, as a child, your your focus is enjoying life, but then you know, your uncles and aunts would come and they would talk to you about, you know, what do you want to be in the future? And you know, there's this saying out there, you know, Nigerian families, if you're not a doctor, engineer, or lawyer, you know, you know, there's there's no other option. Um, but my parents were actually very supportive of, you know, just me making, make, they cared, the one thing they cared about was that I did well in school. That was pretty much it. So my goal was to do well in school, whatever happens after that happens after that. Um, as a child, my my dad was a civil engineer. Um, so I'm a second generation civil engineer. Um, so I grew up in the life of a civil engineer. Um, dad, my, I watched my dad do consulting, uh, drawing. He used to have his own um, the T-square. He used to do his own drawings. Um, and I used to bother him all the time. So he got tired of me and he just bought me maps. So I would sit in his office for hours while he's doing his work. And I'm just tracing maps, you know, just so I don't bother him. And that was kind of like my way to get into like the, the realm of, you know, geology, geography, understanding the world as a, a bigger space. Um, so from there, you know, I kind of went from there. And over time, you know, civil engineering was always there, you know, but, you know, as, as you get older and older, you, can, you start hearing about, you know, well, what makes the most money, you know, rich guy. Bill Gates and all these other. So I'm like, oh, I, got, I want to be the richest person alive. So I'm like, what can I do to get this? So that was that was the case for a little bit, and then that kind of died away. And then when I got into when I got to um, high school here in the states, um, I actually I, I just figured I, I would just go just default to what I know, which is engineering. 
because my dad was an engineer. Uh, my mom was an entrepreneur, so and my dad had his own business, so I kind of had that free spirit minded. I didn't really want to work for anybody, but I also wanted to gain experience. So it was kind of a weird conundrum that I sit that I sat in. But I got to college and you know I applied to different schools. I just applied to civil engineering. I know I applied to nuclear engineering for one of them. Didn't get it. That's cool. Eventually got back in. Uh, but uh, I ended up a civil engineer at Davis, so that was what I did, and I just you know over time it worked out. And then I didn't really think of faculty, you know. My freshman year in college, I was more so concerned with graduating. That was a big deal for me. I just wanted to graduate as fast as possible, um, which was not smart, you know. And somebody eventually talked me out of it. Um, but then, as I as I continued to, you know, evolve and traverse through the undergraduate experience, you know, then I learned all these different things, discovered all these different things, discovered geotech, um, and that was that. You know, that was it. You know, the geotech part kind of made its way because, as a child, you know, I mean, this goes back to my dad. Um, my dad and I used to watch Discovery Channel a lot um, in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. So I used to watch, you know, di- dinosaurs were very fascinating. To me. I love the aspect of dinosaurs. And a lot of things, a lot of things that have people to understand is that archaeology has a lot to do with soil development, soil properties, and mm-hmm. geotech. Um, you have to excavate. You know, it's, yeah. it's there's a huge portion of archaeology that's very much so geotech related. And I didn't know at the time, but I was, you know, just the idea of geology and the evolution of the planet. Fascinating completely. I an engineer, we used to watch engineering, I forgot what it was, this show like engineering wonders or something like that in Discovery Channel. We would see all these buildings get built. So I, you know, so finding out geot- when I found geotech, I'm like, oh man, this is perfect. It's yeah. like the world I love and the world that I know, and they just combined them. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's it just made sense. You know? And then eventually I just kept, I kept on following the path and yeah. it led me to the faculty, you know. At some point I did de- at some point I developed my love for research. I was always inquisitive. So I developed my love for research. And then, you know, it kind of went his way over here, just step by step. It's beautiful. It's so cool that, you know, you went from, I want to graduate as fast as possible to getting a terminal degree, right? It's like. <laughs> the complete opposite. That was yeah, not exactly. planned. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was not planned. It was like, I'm going to leave 10 years later. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> oh, man. Well, prior to joining USC, I understand you were practicing as a as an engineering consultant. What made you make the transition from consultant to professor in your engineering career, and 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 how was that transition? <clears throat> so, um, that's an interesting story. <laughs> that's a very interesting <laughs> story. Uh, let me start. Okay, I'll start with the birth of my daughter, and okay. at the same time, a bleak pers- perspective of landing an academic job. Uh, this was it was I was finishing my second year in postdoc um, fellowship. It was like October of 2019. I had just returned from a visit at a university in the Midwest slash Southern region in hopes of landing an academic position. It didn't pan out. So after that, my daughter was born. And once she was born, you know, there's this huge thing with once you become a parent, you know, you just there's a lot of realizations come to play. And one of the realizations was like, I could no longer afford to chase um, this dream of becoming a professor and conducting research based on how things had gone so far at the time. Um, at the time, my new industry was an option and, and, and a good one at that. But when you go through academia, there's, there's this unspoken allure or notion um, that I had, which is false, by, by the way, that anything other than an academic position after the PhD will be falling short in terms of success. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I want to just I want to say that this is my personal thought um, and does not represent anyone other than myself. Mm-hmm. I know some people, other people who have expressed similar feelings, but I'm speaking for myself. Right. Yep. Um, so. Pretty much that that thought of not being successful, I kind of got over that quickly. You know, having a baby makes that easy to get over. Say, like, okay, that doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, my my focus was provided for my family. So I found, I, and I wanted to do something also that I was interesting and that I can do for a career. And you know, industry and geotech was perfect. You know, then, you know, it worked out perfectly. It was great. So I went on the job market for the industry job market, and then. Had a couple of interviews, some discussions, and eight months later, I got a job offer from an awesome company. Uh, I was going to start in August. Now, because of this opportunity that I just got, um, my timeline as a postdoc, as a researcher in my academic life, had an end date. So I had to wrap up as much as I could before I left. Um, and I, I just to get to preface, it was my intention, 100,000%, to p- go fully into my career as a practice engineer. I had written a five-year plan. I was working on a 10-year plan wow. for that company I was going to be in. I was gonna like, okay. I'm going as a as an, a, 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 a project engineer. I'm going to go up. I'm going to after a couple of years, I'll move up. My whole was my goal was to you know work on these projects. You know they have these student projects. You know help start start chasing projects and making connections. You know 
the thing that you do as a practicing engineer, yep. you know, going to go find clients, making those connections, that networking. And then the company at the time was actually expanding. They had expanded from California to Guam to New Zealand. I was like, you know what, you know, maybe we can think about, I can try and spear an expansion to Africa, Nigeria. You know, my dad had a company there. So I had this full plan. I know my, I was creating this plan. And then, um, you know, all of a sudden things changed because, you know, because prior to all this, to begin the offer, um, I had garnered in, in, uh, some interest from, you know, the university close by where I'm at now. Um, but due to circumstances that are too long to discuss, things kind of hit us, you know, a stall point, you know, COVID, a few other things, mm. you know. So, but however, after I kind of received that industry offer through some mysterious way, the academic opportunity came up. Um, so I listened to the universe. <laughs> that, that was pretty much it. Um, it was, just, it was, it was a, it's a crazy, crazy ride. It was a crazy ride. That is cool. That is cool. It's amazing that, you know, one makes five year plans and 10 year plans. And then what one does in year three or four doesn't look like the five or the 10, right? It's <laughs> impossible. Yeah. It's, it doesn't, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, they, they, there's this saying that you know, they say, if you want to make God laugh, you know, tell me your plan. And then <laughs> he was definitely laughing because I was, I, I thought I had everything figured out. That is hilarious. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, I mean, we would never just throw away plans, you know, but I think that it, it kind of puts us in the position for that next opportunity, you know, exactly. and, and I think you you keep your mind open and, and you see where you land, but no, that's, that's really great. And I, I'd love to hear, you know, I, I understand that, you know, you have research that involves modeling geomaterials and investigating seismic and other natural hazards. Talk about that a little bit. And then also talk about, you know, what are the different seismic hazards and how do you measure seismic risk? So my research interests are focused on properly characterizing seismic side effects in sedimentary basins and also non-basic areas. And what a sedimentary basin essentially is a depression in the earth that's filled with sediments that from erosion and mass wasting coming off the hills and mountains and eventually forms a flat, low-lying plain. You know, there's lots of basins in the world. You know, LA has a big basin. San Francisco Bay Area has a basin. Salt Lake City is a basin. Las Vegas, Houston is in the basin. You know, there's a great basin in the East Coast. You know, the entire Mississippi Delta. Uh, you know, all those places are basins. So there's bases all over the world. Um, Kathmandu, um, Mexico City. You know, it can be, I can keep going. So the reason I'm focused on characterizing side side effects in those in those places is because. This component of site this, this component of site responses of particular importance because it kind of relates to the induction of hazard levels that affect infrastructure that's critical to life and safety of the global population, particularly when it comes to day to day living. living you know, an important type of infrastructure that is adversely affected by basin effects are medium to tall buildings, um, and this is because the natural period of, of these structures coincides with the typical period of a seismic wave. You know associated with basin effects. So once the wave goes through basin effects, and this depends on the, on the size of the basin and the depth, you know, the shape, you know, it could be medium buildings are affected, so it could be taller buildings that can be between. Um, and also bridges are susceptible, you know. So that 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 makes for a big, big issue because most of the world right now is kind of concentrated in these urban environments. Um, and, and like for instance, okay, we just hit we just hit eight billion people in the world. Like this was this was like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Right. Out of that eight billion, about five billion are in urban populations. Get out of here. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> about sixty percent of the of the eight billion live in urban populations. Now, if you look back back in two thousand, it was forty seven percent, and then in two thousand and ten, it was fifty percent. So that was a three percent increase. Mm -hmm. In the last ten years, we've added another ten percent to urban. So the urban, the urban population is exponentially increasing. So because of that, you know, kind of. The way we kind of deal with stuff in our present society is we kind of build up to kind of meet those demands. You know, we, we saw that all those tall buildings that are being built um, back when we went to the ASC conference, mm -hmm. massive, beautiful works. But these things, are, if you don't plan, if you don't just design them properly, they're not going to last a, a long time. And people are going to live. It's going to cause a lot of casualties. Um, so in, in truth, seismic risk kind of depends on the feature of interest that you're interested in. So and it's kind of hard to dissociate infrastructure performance and life safety. As a result, you know, seismic risk depends on the type, age, and the use case of the infrastructure. And as you know, we have a big issue in the U.S. with aging infrastructure. <laughs> so that can give you an indicator of what kind of the issues we face um, in seismic prone areas. 
Um, but the short and slightly simple explanation is that in order to quantify risk, you first have to characterize your hazard. That's the, that's the first step, right? You can't determine risk without knowing what's going to happen. Meaning you have to know to some degree how hard you're going to get hit. Uh, and what's the probability of that scenario, right? You know, then once you get that, then you have to sit there and associate the hazard levels with some level of damage mm. or no damage. And this essentially is the fragility of the system, which is a, I'm sure it's a very common, commonplace thing. And then what you do is you take that fragility of the system and that characterization of the hazard, and then you combine them under some level of exposure, the use case of population, whether it's a service or a resource to some to the population, um, whether it's a building or a power plant, and then you're able to determine the risk level. Um, so that's kind of what you need. You kind of need to, it's a full couple of steps to kind of get to the risk. And the seismic risks are, they vary, but you have this risk from shaking, you have the risk from ground failures, liquefaction, lateral spreading, you know, those, the, the, there, there are a significant amount of risks that you can deal with. Um, you have, you know, from Northridge, you have derivative, derivative damages that can occur, fire, flooding, you know, those things. And so earthquakes and seismic activities kind of, kind of run the gamut of what you can deal with when it comes to all kinds of hazards. Um, and, you know, you know, and then we still have other natural hazards. You know, clearly we saw what happened recently in uh, Florida. Yeah. Uh, that's, those are not going to stop anytime soon. So all kinds of hazard and risk that we deal with, you know, uh, are necessary. Seismic risk just happens to be a big issue in the West Coast. <laughs> um, but, you know, the East Coast also has a seismic issue in Charleston, yep. New Madrid, you know. I, you know, New York has a small fault just over there, just north of it by, by uh, Rochester, you know. There are faults here and there, you know. It's, <laughs> that's, that's the reason why those, those places look so nice, you know. Yeah. The faults are to put them together, so, you know. <laughs> Wow. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong, a lot of things that go right. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of things you have to think about. A yes. lot of things you have to think about. So sort of like the basics of, uh, you know, you know what it is you're doing, you know, how would you explain what a seismic site response is? And I'm sure some students listening in and they're scratching their head right now. <laughs> they're saying, make it make sense. <laughs> so, you know, so, so sometimes, you know, the allure of these statements, and the, you know, especially with the people who present these work, you know, it's like jargonized. You become so like you know become so wrapped up in the in the mystery of it. But the truth is, seismic site response is just a response, or some will say the behavior of a particular location under earthquake under earthquake excitation. That's pretty much it. You know, it's inf and the main thing to know is that it's influenced by a variety of physical mechanisms. You know, resonance, nonlinearity, topographic effects, amplification due to impedance contrast or changes in stiffness in the subsurface. Um, and 3D wave propagation effects in sedimentary basins. All those things kind of contribute to site response. You know, it, it's it's the same with trying to figure out, you know, it's, it's not different to trying to figure out the shear strength mm -hmm. of, of some kind of soil, sand or clay or gravel. You know, it's, it's you're trying to understand the behavior of this particular material. In this case, I'm trying to understand the behavior of this site, which is a compilation of a, a stack of material mm -hmm. and also some kind of orientation and hazard from distance or close by so it varies uh, that's pretty much it excellent thank you for that thank you for that now now infrastructure is something that you know we've been talking about for a while right it's something that we're focusing in on now we have a you know bipartisan bill so infrastructure is going to get addressed right we have aging infrastructure that mm -hmm. has its own challenges right but but what is the impact of an earthquake on infrastructure and on aging infrastructure well um as I was saying earlier, the, the amplification, particularly due to 3D wave propagation in sedimentary basins, can lead to excessive amplitude. So I'll give you an example. For instance, in, in Southern California, Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles alone, has about maybe close to about 10 million people, which is huge, mm -hmm. right? This includes the San Fernando Valley, the Los, the Los Angeles Basin, which is massive, the San Gabriel Valley, which is also a basin, and if we have a magnitude seven earthquake occur right here down the street mm -hmm. uh, on the new, on the Hayward in, the, the Newport Ingle Fault, it's going to be a bad situation for us in here. Wow. <laughs> it's, wow. it's, it's going to be pretty bad. We hope wow. that it happens. happen. So mm -hmm. you know this because and because we're in the basin, we just get more right. Think, you know, you can imagine. Think about how um, the orchestra in like uh, in the amphitheater, mm -hmm. why that's how that sound gets to you yeah. from down there. You know, it's just it's bouncing back and forth of all, and that's, they make the walls so yeah. it bounces back and forth. Well, 
Mother Nature does the same thing, you know, and she's pretty good. She's probably yeah. she's more good than we are at creating things that reflect. So it's just, you know, we're just going to get, we, it's going to get bringing, you know, increased duration, amplification, you know, and this just increases the, the demand on the structures, whether mm -hmm. it's tall structures, you know, you know, lifelines, pipelines, it, there's all kinds of things that happen. So you can get collapse and loss of life just from shaking the loan. Huh. But that's just one component. We also have ground failures that can cause, that, that happen from earthquakes, fault rupture. Liquefaction, lateral spreading, excessive settlement, landslides, and many others. And these damages could they could affect lifelines like water pipelines, yeah. gas pipelines, uh, and for the for the younger generation, the communication like, like, like the communication network. Oh my God! Yeah, don't no let, Wi-Fi. Don't let, what do we do? Don't let the Wi-Fi go. <laughs> oh, it's a wrap. Because you know, some people just don't know how to live without Wi-Fi. So, yeah. you know, transportation networks, you know, the bridges, you know, all those things can get destroyed from Earthquakes or the you know ground shaking or derivatives from from earthquakes, you know. Like for instance, we just came back from Taiwan. I was part of the gear team that went to Taiwan to kind of investigate and do, do reconnaissance for the um, September eighteenth or nineteenth magnitude six point nine earthquake in the in south in south uh, southeastern Taiwan, and they had bridges like these are critical bridges by the way that connected a valley. Without these bridges, you can't really get across. Completely collapsed. We talk we're like. Other collapse. Wow. What do you do? Luckily, they had some bridges that survived. Um, so they were able to now, you know, everything is funneled to one bridge. But what does that do for your community? Now, luckily for Taiwan, that region of Taiwan is not heavily, heavily populated. It's, mm -hmm. most, it's mostly agriculture. But imagine that happening in somewhere like Los Angeles. Wow. Or somewhere wow. like, you know, like Atlanta, the, the, the area between Atlanta and Charleston. Something crazy like that. It would be pandemonium. It would be yeah. crazy. You know, yeah. look, look what happened recently with all this, all these pipe, the supply chains. And that, this, this was just a small situation. Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, that's uh, that's that's that, that's kind of impacts we can have. Wow, it just shows how how important <laughs> how important it is that we're focusing in on these things. And um, <clears throat> it's one of those things where, you know, you have time, right? Well, we don't have time because these things are going to keep happening. So we have mm -hmm. to stay in front of the next disaster, which is exactly. uh, it almost sounds like the, the storm chaser shows. Right? It's <laughs> like you have to stay in front of it. Well, I want to, I want to double down a little bit on this. So, so Dr. Nwike, if we were to evaluate seismic damage of urban road infrastructures, like, like that's something that's important, but why is, why is it important? Why is that so, important? So as I was saying, like the one thing that people take for granted significantly is the roads they drive on. Hmm. We can plan, you know, a lot, of, like, for instance, I'll give you an example. The city of Oakland has a big issue with potholes, right? Mm -hmm. It's a big issue, but it doesn't really affect, I guess, the the global economy, right? But it, it significantly affects the local economy because people's cars, they're getting messed up, spending yeah. more on tires, you know, more repairs. But imagine this now on a bigger scale, right? These transmission systems are conduits. They're, they are super critical systems because they serve as conduits for resource. Yeah. and sustenance and more like imagine right now in your body one of your blood vessels just shuts off wow you'll be that's dead a problem. yeah that's a problem. you'll be dead right yeah. so now imagine imagine now we have this network this conduit a network of transition systems that connect east coast to west coast north to south you know and on top of that further to the, to the rest of the world yeah. so the disruptions to these systems will deficit alignment right we can see what happened for instance when the canal got blocked for yeah. a week people yeah. it's almost pandemonium yeah. Or when or when the ships couldn't dock at the port here in LA. Hmm. Now we you know lumber went up 150%. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everything is going up like we see we talk about inflation. You know, yeah. people who are worried about and rightfully so the, the inflation that's due to the the pumping of money into the economy. But people forgot that that inflation started from the the, the disruption of the infrastructure, wow. the transportation. You know, yeah. so like for instance, imagine like okay, for instance, like interstate the I the I-10 which goes from kind of LA to Santa Monica mm -hmm. and connects all the way to pretty much East coast, Florida, Pensacola and, and Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. Now imagine just from the LA to Texas that we have the San Andreas fault just destroys the road completely mm. between LA and Texas. Now, you know, the goods from Asia and the Pacific can't get to the rest of the country. Wow. Right. Similar situation if the, with the, with the, the interstate 15 at the Cohon pass, that's the road that goes from LA to Vegas, to Utah and Montana or Idaho. 
that that cajon pass is the conduit, a, a major conduit because it houses not only the road, it also houses the railroad that for Union Pacific that pretty much takes everything over there. It houses our gas pipelines. Wow. You know, you know, it, you know, it, it, emergency pipelines. So, and that's one of the most dangerous places is because that's where the San Andreas kind of meets the San Jacinto. It's a big issue. Mm -hmm. If that goes off, you wow. it pretty much it would be like fireworks. It'd be like a Michael Bay movie if that ever ruptures. It'd be fire <laughs> everywhere. It'd be it'd be crazy. Yes. So and, and and the same thing, you know, like I said, with the, the I the I-85 or 95, if that's damaged by the Charleston zone earthquake, you know, there will be it, big issues for goods and services. So yeah. you know, we need to kind of this is this is some of the things that we need to address. And we're working on this as a as a community, the industry and the research community. That's our goal. But you know, luckily we got this infrastructure bill because we got a lot of stuff we need to fix. Yeah. Um, number one is the railroad system. You know, US, unfortunately, America, though we're you know, greatest country ever. We have one of the worst railroad systems. <laughs> Can you like if you could if you take apples to apples and take the U.S. rail system and compare it to any other rail system in the world for like top comparable countries, Japan, <laughs> Switzerland, you know, you know the U.K. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about they're they're like moving at like light speed compared to what we're dealing with. Mm. You know, we don't we don't even have a high speed rail in oh. in the U.S. <laughs> We don't even have a high speed rail like, like that. It's it's twenty twenty two. There's yeah. no high speed rail in the U S. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> it's like we're talking about things that people have been having. Japan has had a high speed rail for golly yeah. almost thirty years. Yeah. So you know we got like we got but luckily we got some money. You know mm -hmm. everybody you know we're pouring money into the infrastructure because truth be told these infrastructure when they get fixed you know we have jobs we make it better we make it safer we're improving sustainability we're improving resilience. We're pushing, we're pushing, we're improving the livelihood of our population. Yeah. And that, that leads to more jobs, you know, better health. All these things are connected. So we're trying to make the world a better place here. So many things. Beautiful. We, we may not get we may not get all the the love and the, the sexiness <laughs> of the 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 the, the computer science. Well, you know, we're we're doing we're doing the grunt work, man. We're doing the stuff that's necessary. Without us, you can't have no hospital. Facebook can't have no building. So Facebook <laughs> can't have no building without us there, you know, you know. <laughs> what, what are you yeah, gonna do? Cold in the cold in the streets. <laughs> you know, um, We're doing the things that nobody sees that not many people appreciate, but it is necessary exactly. and essential. That is true. Exactly. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's great. Well, I know that you're involved with various associations in community. <clears throat> How has that experience helped you to grow your engineering career? And 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 I know that you've been passionate about the things that you're doing, but how's that has that helped you to grow your career? Um Again, just excuse the cliche, but okay, there you know the saying that no man is an island is very important. It's it's kind of a foundational principle for us as global citizens. Yeah. Um, it's you know it's, it's people have many different adages. Like you know, the same thing is it takes a village, right? Mm -hmm. You need a community, you need a cohort, mentors, associates, friends, families, colleagues, etc. Every member of your community serves a purpose for its other members, right? And the benefits of a community are simple. Is the ability to be grown and to help others grow. That's what a community is for, right? You know, a forest is not just one tree, right? These, you know, the combinations of, of variety and specifications and specializations all come together to provide a resource for things to thrive. Um, I have benefited significantly, greatly from the communities I've, I'm a member of. Um, you know, the, going all the way back to undergrad, shoot, going back as far as my, you know, my childhood, my family was my first. Yeah. You know, my so that was very important to for who I am. You know, going to undergrad, I learned a lot of leadership and listening skills as a Nesby board member, Region Six. You know, here in the East Coast, in the West Coast, mm -hmm. I learned practical and problem solving skills as the co-captain of the ASC Geo Wall team, right at UC Davis. You know, participation participating mid pack mid pack competitions where I got to meet with other other individuals and and you know you know sharpen your steel. Um, I cultivated my critical thinking skills as a graduate student through my research, but also through discussions with members of the Geotechnical Society at the GOC2 conferences, at ERI conferences, you know, and others. Um, the network that I have was developed through all these experiences um, and many more in a variety of communities. I have, I've had a, the massive fortune to have been a member of or to have access to these communities and it has served me significantly. Um, these are places where I often reach out for advice, insight, or inspiration, right? Um, these people are there to guide you, um, give you some, you know, you know nobody's perfect. 
you know, that's the one thing that's guaranteed in life. You will make a mistake, yeah. right? It's, 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 there's nobody in this world that has gone through everything and it's like A plus, 100%. No, we're sitting there, most people are sitting around 75. You know, you're, you're sitting around the C, C plus at best, you know, at best, at, at best, you know, so you know, we'll make mistakes. And when you make those mistakes, you know, you need to essentially know that you have people to support you, right? Because when you're in isolation, you have no perspective. Yeah. And when you have no perspective, you have no vision. And without the vision, you have nowhere to go, right? Yeah. You're just sitting down, twiddling your thumbs. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a devastating thing. So I, I think, you know, my communities have been very, very important. Um, the committees, you know, the friendships, you know, all those things. Every single one of those moments has made me who I am today um, and has contributed to the to the value that I, I I now have and I'm able to share with others. It's it's a big deal. Uh, that's great. For anybody that's listening in, it's not a part of a community. Do what the good doctor said. Join a community. It is very important. Very important. And you're right. The one of the worst things that can happen, especially somebody is a, is a geotechnical engineer is to be working in isolation, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you, you want to be around other folks. So that's, that's really good counsel. Before we take our break, final piece of advice you want to give the listeners and, and those watching. So, um, final piece of advice. Um, I, I would just share kind of, kind of, a, a kind of a mantra that I, I, I kind of hold to, which is essentially, push the boundaries of your comfort zone. Mm. Um, always push the boundaries of your comfort zone. In doing so, find comfort in being uncomfortable. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to suck at first, right? It's, it's going to be frustrating, but I can promise you the benefits far outweigh the cons it, by, by leaps and bounds. You know, not, like, you know, as growing up, I always heard a thing, nothing worthwhile comes easy, and much that is easy is often not worthwhile, right? Mm. So in essence, you know, the truth is just give full effort in things that are important and necessary. You know, the things that are not that are important but not immediately necessary, they have their time and place. You know, but focus on the things that you can make significant impact on and allocate some portion of your other time to those important, less necessary things. Anything outside of that is not critical to your progress. And dropping them should not affect your trajectory at all. <laughs> and actually, once you start dropping them, you'll find out that you don't regret or you don't miss any things you drop because you're because you're going to be focusing on the things that matter, right? We don't have, we have a finite amount of time on this planet and your job is to maximize your time on this planet to the best of your ability. Now, I know sometimes you're going to, it's, I'm not talking about, you know, we're, I'm not some guy that preaches, oh, I'm constantly moving. Gung -ho. I have my low times too and my down times. The goal is that, that those times don't consume you. I mean, you, you, they're like they're like a storm. They're gonna pass. You know, you just wait and they pass. Or you, or you actually most most people. There's there's this um thing I learned recently about buffaloes, and how buffaloes when they see the clouds coming because they don't like to be wet. When they see the clouds coming, they run into the storm because they know that 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 will lead them to have the shortest amount of time in the water. Wow. So it so I know so if you can run into the storm, if things get difficult, dive into it. It's it's not gonna last forever, right? It's, it's gonna pass, right? And more than anything, the most important thing is to enjoy yourself, right? This is the hardest thing to do because um, we are our own worst critic. Um, I still struggle with this significantly. So I'm a work in progress in a lot of things. Um, and so the things that I try to do is, you know, congratulate yourself. Be grateful for any progress you make, no matter how little. Acknowledge it. You know, it's much, it's much harder to acknowledge your success. And it's very, very easy to focus on your mishaps and your errors. So focus on the successes and use the errors as a lesson, uh, essentially as, as an investment in your progress. So that's, that's my last piece of advice. Wow. That's solid. That's solid. I almost don't want to stop. <laughs> that's solid. Well, thank you so much. We're going to come back in just oh, a minute. You. Close this one out with Dr. Nueke in our career factor safety end segment. Stick around. All right, welcome back. It's time for our career factor safety end segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with Dr. Chukwe Buka Nueke, assistant professor at the University of Southern California. Dr. Nueke, 
you've already had a very successful career, which I know is not over, right? I don't want to say like you've retired. <laughs> but when you look back at your career so far, what is the one thing you've implemented in your career to give yourself, let's call it a factor of safety in your career? You know, <laughs> um, I'm just at the beginning of the career. I know, I just, yeah, right. I you just started. You just started. I'm still starting. Start. Start. <laughs> start. uh, I got, I got a ways to go. I got, yeah. I got, I got a ways to go. I'm still trying to get to you. Okay. We gotta, okay. we gotta, we gotta knock that. That's gonna, that's gonna happen. We're gonna yeah. knock that wall down first, and then yeah. when I get there, I'll let you guys know. You guys see, but you no, know, I will say, um, the way I, the way I introduce a factor of safety, um, is by always ensuring that no matter the situation, um, that my decision is best. My decision that I make is based on the best available information available at the time. Um, meaning that regardless of the path, even if it gets, if, if my path is like super foggy, meaning I have no idea what I'm doing. I always take the next step in front of me that is the best step in front of me. Mm -hmm. And and this course of action kind of requires that you kind of plan for the worst, hope for the best, right? So, you know, you know they have to say, you know, it's the idea of faith, right? You know, I'm, I'm a man that kind of indulges a lot in faith. So, and faith is, what faith is essentially is taking a step even when you don't know what's in front of you. But believing that each step that you take Will inevitably lead you to the destination that is meant for you. So that's kind of my way of doing it. And I just, I, everything I do, as I, I told you, I'm just, I just, I make the plan, I do this, I just take whatever step I think is best. And then when the universe speaks, I listen, I just keep moving. That's, that's kind of what I do. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Nueke, for coming on and sharing all the great insights with us. You share some great information and advice that I know is going to be helpful for our listeners and those that are watching. Now, if somebody is listening or watching this, I want to, reach out to him. What's the best way for people to get you? Are you on social media or an email address you want to share? We'll get that so, in the show notes. So, you know, you can reach me um, on a number of things, you know, okay. you know I, I try to be uh, young and hip. So uh, I'm, a, I'm accessible via Twitter um, okay. at Dr. B-U-K-4. Um, so it's at D-R-B-U-K-4. Um, I'm also on, uh, quote unquote, as young people call today, the gram. IG, um, uh, same, same, same handle, uh, at, uh, Dr. B-U-K-4. And, uh, for us that are slightly older, um, uh, I'm also on Facebook, <laughs> if you'd like to reach me, um, uh, and then LinkedIn, you know, I'm always available via LinkedIn, just type my name and you find me on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm, I'm accessible. You just find me, you know, you know, so I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming on. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 66, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, we wish you the very best in all of your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.